Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Wherever you're joining from, thanks a lot for making it to day two of the regional scrum gathering Kolkata 2021. My name is Meghna and I'm your host for the session with Victor Loki. Let me take a few seconds to introduce Victor, really a few seconds, because we would like to hear a lot more from Victor himself on his talk and on his experiences. So ladies and gentlemen, for you, Victor is an organizational and executive coach, and he has deep knowledge in R&D across multiple industries and domains. Currently, he's working as a lead consultant in CERTIS, which is a big data and artificial intelligence consulting firm based in Bangkok. Victor has, to his credit, several certifications from ICF, from Scrum Alliance, and, the, and also from Scrum at Scale. So it's a very interesting journey with Victor, who in his spare time enjoys art, in particular pen art, and he's also a local food lover. So he definitely is enjoying a lot of local food right now with the travel restrictions, unfortunately, but around the place where he stays currently, which is Singapore. And if Victor would not have been an agile coach, then probably he would have just taken a lot of fun in life, discovering where life takes him. And with this, I would like to hand it over to Victor for a very, very in interesting session on retrospectives. Over to Victor. Thank you, Magana, for the introduction. Um, so thank you, everyone, for making time to attend uh, the RSG and um, my session. Um, it gives me incredible privilege to be here today, um, to be invited to present uh, as a um, track session speaker. So um, my um, yeah, before that, yeah, just like a shout out to the RSG Kolkata team for a, a fantastic job done um, in putting together this uh, splendid conference. Um, so my session today is um, on um, evidently um, retrospectives. And what I'll be touching on um, are the introspective aspects or the introspection around um, conducting retrospectives with the um, hope of taking the team to real growth and real heights. Um, hopefully, this session um, would be useful learning for some of us and that we can practice some of the tips that I share in this session. So um, just quickly about myself, as Magana mentioned, I'm an ICF PCC and Certified Scrum Professional, as well as a Belden Accredited Team Coach and Facilitator. So if you're interested in connecting, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, so um, prior to this session, I did a survey uh, with my fellow Agile colleagues who are in their organizations operating in the various Scrum roles or Agile roles. And I asked them, um, what is the first thing they think about um, when I asked them the question, what do your retros look like? And I've got a myriad of answers, I think uh, almost 100. Uh, I picked out the more interesting ones. Um, and, and so some of them have said, we have it for an hour. We use start, stop, continue. We always have actionable outcomes that we bring into the next sprint's backlog. We use sailboat. The meeting is optional. Sometimes a few people don't turn up. We shake things up with different techniques. What went well, what can be improved, the next step, the classic um, agile retro. We skip it because we are too busy. We do it as part of our Friday lunch and we run it whenever our Scrum Master is around. So what I found really intriguing about this, um, oh, pardon. Um, So, um, well, do you see my video, Magana? Nope, Victor, your video, unfortunately, is not visible in the 
in the video tab so you can hide it and un uh, and come back uh, just once and uh, otherwise continue with the session because sure. we might lose time. Well, let me try that again. How about now? No. In, in the speaker window, we still don't see your video. Can I do a refresh? Hmm, presentation. Oh, so one of the attendees said the video is visible, but the presentation is not. I'm not sure I've not changed any settings. Okay, uh, I think let's go ahead. Let me try to see if yeah. we can troubleshoot something in the background. Yeah. Um, anyways, um, yep, so I'll resume my presentation. Um, sorry. Sorry for the attack. Yeah. So, um, what, I, what I found in intriguing about just a few descriptive words around their retros um, is that if we read into some of these, it tells us quite a bit if we are curious about what's happening um, behind how they conduct their retros, right? So for, uh, a good example here is the one on the left here that I'm circling. The meeting is optional. Sometimes a few people don't turn up. Um, so I am a proponent of having optional meetings um, as it is a good indication that the, um, the Scrum Master has the intention of out getting a feel of the engagement of the team with these meetings. So um, it could tell, it tells me a few things, right? Either the team is able to self-manage and decide what meetings to take precedence or priority over another. Um, but also interesting that they view that the retro is something that they can skip. So um, before we move into the meat of the presentation proper, I'd like to invite everyone to join the Miro board um, that is posted on chat. And I'd like to invite you to share some of the stickies that you see in your retros. Um, just one or two would do. Uh, we will have um, three to five minutes to do this, uh, depending on whether we get um, any more contributions at that point.
All right, folks, we'll have one more minute. Oh, pardon, I was on mute. Right, so uh, thank you all um, for the contribution. So let's take a look at the mirror bot. So um, what went well? Um, there is a sense of ownership from all members. Excellent. Um, discussed on what went well, what needs to be improved, and what is happening in the end of each sprint. Excellent. Team coordination within the team and outside the team with other teams. Participation, safety, authenticity. Great. And for what didn't go well, uh, team members are recitient. People stay quiet and do not share their thoughts. Excellent. Uh, a very common theme. Sprint goals were not achieved. Digression. Uh, domination of discussion. Yes, also a very common theme. Thank you. Uh, and next steps. Plan for fun activities, but takes time. Uh, fun activities, similar. And commitment to do something or improve. And willingness to admit mistakes and desire to embrace changes. Great, thank you. Um, so, similar theme, right? Um, in my observation, when I do go see on teams in my organization, I see stickies that often look like this um, in, 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 in some of the stickies that are shared in the uh, mirror board as well as uh, on the slide now. Right? So things like sprint planning was fast and efficient. Pipeline was finished on time, environment separation, data is available when needed. We improved our DOD, CI automation is nearly done. What didn't go well could be could not finish regression, testing. Only me who can do this work today. Underestimated my PBI, spent too much time debugging my feature, and to be more focused on my tasks. Now, um, this is all good um, in that the team is at least conscious of uh, continuous improvement. Uh, or the need for continuous improvement. Um, what's um, intriguing is that without a bit of a nudge or push from the Scrum Master or coach, it is not often that team members, in most cases, um, actually talk about people issues or um, interpersonal issues, perhaps with the team or outside the team. And contrast the previous slide with this one, right? What retros can be. So what went well? I actually asked for help. I didn't manage to get through this PBI, right? Our review is attracting more folks each time. Sheila offered to pair me, right? And what didn't go well? So nothing actually stopped me from doing XX, but somehow I did not get around to it. I didn't warn Jane early enough that this PBI won't make it in time. Or Jake and I couldn't agree. And the PO and SM also contributes with their personal observations or experiences. So when we see sticky notes that use the word I, it's usually a good indication that that individual is or has a heightened level of self-awareness. Um, and it's not Im usually immediately achievable in new teams. And this is the crux of what this presentation is about, how to get our teams to that level of self-vulnerability.
that we desire in any meaningful, fulfilling engagement as a team. So like how a sprint review is a window into your product for the stakeholders and uh, customers or end users, right? The sprint retrospective is your window into your team. And in order to be able to look into that window, we need to stay truly curious and continually hold space for them. And by truly curious, I meant keeping an open mind and not coloring our perspectives with our own lenses or judgment. Um, by now, most of us will be familiar with this book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. And um, essentially, um, these five characteristics are very common in teams, especially newly formed teams. The absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and inattention to results. And the indication that a team is working around each of these dysfunctions would be on the right, right? Uh, so for example, the absence of trust, we would see a team trying to get past this if they are opening up to mutual vulnerability. And similarly, uh, they will be open to positive dissent um, in overcoming fear of conflict. And the team understands the need to buy in and to commit. They hold one another accountable and the team is focused on wins and results. But what's key here is that this entails a paradigm shift in mindset. And in my experience working with people, mindset shifts are one of the hardest things to accomplish and is best done through a coaching intervention. So coaching interventions, when done well, tend to result in lasting positive change in the individual. And this is also the premise for which any agile transformation, if and usually is expected of the organization to have it be long lasting and positive, also requires organizational development, change management, and coaching interventions specifically. And the second point, um, so that, that was for teams. Um, and the second point I'd like to come to now is the empowerment chasm, right? So we hear several forms of crossing the chasm and I'd like to uh, bring our attention to what I term as the empowerment chasm, which first entails climbing the responsibility ladder or the responsibility pro process, uh, which is from denial to laying blame to justification to shame and then to obligation. So many of us would be guilty of this when we, uh, when we just started out in the workforce, right? Um, anytime any well, uh, our colleague comes to us with a well-meaning feedback around how he or she thinks is a better way to approach work. We often, you know, uh, as part of our natural defense mechanism, either deny or labeling. And, um, as we start growing older and start maturing as professionals and individuals, we might start to justify or self-rationalize for why certain things or certain outcomes weren't as promised or as expected. Eventually, we might move to the next phase, which is shame or self-blame. Um, and we know that it's important to inculcate the mindset uh, of not being excessively um, self-blaming or to take it uh, easy on ourselves sometimes. And then obligation. So obligation refers to the um, understanding and intention of wanting to get something done, but not necessarily being engaged in that process. Right? And finally, when they cross the responsibility chasm, they will get to the point of responsibility. However, uh, on a related note, um, from a responsibility, there's also an, uh, an upward movement to accountability. And this is something that really requires nudging and is best done with a coaching intervention. So 
for example, if certain outcomes uh, of an individual are desired, um, if the individual has crossed that chasm into empowerment, uh, he or she would acknowledge the reality first and foremost. So perhaps understand that things are not going to work out that way even if they take basic responsibility. So they have got to start owning the problem, meaning thinking that this problem is, they are wholesome individuals and are fully capable of addressing the problems themselves and to seek the required solutions and last but not least, implement them. Now, this concept of empowerment is fundamental to scrum teams. For any scrum team to be able to be self-managing, it is important that every individual in the team understands that they are empowered to decide how to get the work done and among themselves, how to distribute work, so on and so forth. Um, and to the old or the previous Scrum Guide um, before the last release in uh, 2020, um, it was stated that Scrum is easy to understand and difficult to master, and it still is. The common new Scrum Master pitfall is that, uh, so when perhaps after taking a, a certification course, um, two-day course, and we are certified Scrum Masters, we come back to our teams with the well-meaning intention to teach them Scrum and better ways of work. And we think that we know Scrum, or at least we know better than our colleagues. Now, of a uh, Sit evolving situation that I've observed in the last few years in the Scrum or the Agile community and uh, workplace is the um, proclivity for certain individuals to uh, say or proclaim themselves to be Agile coaches. And um, at the same time, introduce interventions which are not aligned or well aligned with that of professional coaching. Um, so, while obviously we know that this does uh, impact the coaching profession um, as a whole, what's more concerning is that there's also a common perception or understanding that agile coaching isn't the same as professional coaching. It entails mentorship, entails teaching, um, entails facilitation. And um, I wouldn't say that that's wrong. But rather, um, what's tricky about this situation is that um, there isn't an, a body today who actually governs the coaching profession. And as such, people can uh, introduce misunderstanding as to what the coaching intervention is or misrepresent it. And um, because so many people are saying this today, this statement here in bold, they actually justify their actions to the people that they interact with by saying this very same thing, that it isn't the same as professional coaching. So in my view, they are one and the same. Now, I know it's going to be a contentious assertion, but um, this is the crux of this presentation. I'm going to introduce a few tips around situational coaching, which is essentially what agile coaching work entails. Now, the seven servant coach roles, and as we know, the Scrum Master is a servant coach, are the master, the partner, inquirer, reflector, facilitator, mentor, and performer. And in my experience as an agile coach, all of these roles do need to be played. But what is really difficult to do well is the ability to dance between these roles according to the, your interaction with your coachee and team. And there's always, again, an, a proclivity for um, less experienced coaches to lean back on the teaching stance uh, or uh, mentor stance. Um, and this is what we want to try to avoid because we want to help um, our coaches actually become more powerful individuals themselves. And in order to do so, we need to step back at the earliest opportunity and recede into the background. So I'm going to share some questions and tips for how to perform 
uh, these seven roles, right? So the first role is the master, right? So master is one of introspection. So he or she will constantly ask himself these questions, right? To maintain awareness, what do I need to watch out about myself, right? And to be to listen intuitively, what do I want to be attentive on, right? To facilitate learning, how can I help my client learn deeply? Embrace empathy, what do I need to understand about her story? Are my own prejudices showing up? And decide, what does he need now? Role two, the partner, right? To establish the coaching structure. What do you want this coaching journey to do for you? Right? To establish outcomes. How do you know when you have achieved your goal? And then agree on roles. Why do you seek me as your coach? So there are two questions in here that's implicit, right? The first is why do you need a coach? And the second is why me? And the third is the inquirer. So to deepen the client's understanding of his or her situation, what is happening now for you, right? Note the word for, right? And articulate desired outcomes. What exactly is it that you want? Establish causes of action. What is one small step that you can take here? The reflector, to provide timely and honest feedback, right? May I share something that I've noticed in my time with you now? Direct attention to capabilities and the individual's potential. What strengths can you call out? And encourage introspection. May I invite you to spend a few moments here? So this comes back to holding space for the coachy. Facilitator, provide new perspectives. Can I share some thoughts about this with you? Stimulate thinking. What are your thoughts ab about this situation? And support the coaching process. What do you like to talk about first? Then the mentor, encourage action taking. What do you want to commit to now? Offer options for actions. Can I propose a suggestion that may work? And get him or her started. What is the easiest thing that you can do right now? Last but not least, the performer, action taking. How ready are you to take action now? Deal with concerns. What obstacles do you want to look out for? And tracking. What did you learn about yourself after doing this? And when, in, in my experience, those questions in situational coaching apply really well to teams. And at the start of a team engagement, we want to open the team up, right, um, to the coach. And this of, it often helps to start from a place of goodwill, right? So these are the three questions that I recommend uh, when working with new teams as an agile coach. Right? What do you want to be better in? And how would you like me to support you? And how do you know when you are a great team? All right, so I've gotten uh, these questions, albeit with, a, a, a believe, a bit of a shift um, from, or tweaking, from Jeff Watts, right, who is a CST based in the UK. Now, um, I'd like to invite everyone to spend three minutes to revisit the Miro board. And on the board on the right, could I ask for you to share with us one, at least one introspective sticky note, right? So we have three minutes. I don't see any movement on the board. Um, is anyone participating? Oh, okay, I see it. Thank you. Uh, please use the board on the right. So there are two boards. Um, 
one is the old board, the other one is the one on the right, the retro, reflective retro. All right, we have 30 seconds left. All right, um, thank you all for contributing to the board. Let's take a quick look. Um, strong on mentoring. Oh, I, I believe this is um, on a uh, fellow team member. Um, excellent. And so what we did, what I did, and what we are proud of. Nice. Need to explore coaching to empower others to achieve the outcomes. How did that happen? Did I miss something? Nice. Thinking of adapting the coaching stance based on the person. Yes, absolutely. Get more involvement in business from business users to understand how they define DOD. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. Excellent. Nice. Thank you all. So um, thanks for contributing. I hope that was fun. Now, um, I'd like to share 10 tips, um, uh, quick tips on um, conducting introspective retrospectives um, and as you would I hope you will have taken away from the uh, material right uh, the first I would urge is to focus on becoming a good self coach first and foremost before learning how to coach others um, and so by this I I do mean a lot of pep talk a lot of self talk um, even meditation but most importantly reflection uh, think about the way, how the way you conduct yourself as a coach has impacted other people or perhaps um, resulted in the perception that they have of you. Um, this is something you can do by perhaps recording your session, your coaching session with the individual and seeing it in replay and observing how the individual reacts to your questions. And second, please do learn professional coaching. It is extremely helpful. So um, professional coaching as aligned to ICF's code of ethics and core competencies. And also um, it would be helpful if um, we could learn the various coaching models, for example, appreciative inquiry, a three-stage satire model, coactive. Uh, there's also ORSC, uh, organizational Rela relationship systems coaching, which is, um, which is a, a really solid model. Right. Uh, do learn about professional coaching. It will help you greatly. Next advice, coach the person, not the issue. Um, in my go sees and shadow coaching sessions with my Scrum Masters, I observe a, a, a very difficult con yet consistent behavior uh, of the coach, which is that he or she often gets dragged into the issue that the coachee is describing. Now, um, as a coach, we should keep in mind that our focus is on the person and that issue tends to be one that is an is issue only because of his or her perception or, or frame of mind or mind trap. 
Therefore, keep your focus on the person. And I've also I also hear this um, statement bandied around in the agile community in retros, which is focus on the or be on the issue, not on the person. Now, I think it's quite unfortunate that this is going around because we, we miss tremendous opportunities in helping to raise our team's uh, collective self-awareness as well as our individual's individual self-awareness. Um, tip four, master and master courage, right? Be ready to challenge your coaches to improve. Ask the tough questions, call him or her out. Right? At the same time, challenge what you know. So this means being curious again. And perhaps your coachee has something to teach you. Your team has something to teach you. It will be helpful to keep an open mind. And last but not least, with regards to courage, start coaching, real coaching, not fake coaching, and keep at it to improve. Don't pretend that you are coaching when you are not. It's not going to do you any favors. And you are not setting a good example as well in the responsibility ladder. Five, spend time reaching out to and coaching individuals on your team. So what I mean by this is don't just coach the team during retrospectives, right? Spend time sitting down with each of them and having actual one-to-one -one conversations with them. Um, the reason is that it's often very difficult to achieve complete vulnerability at the team level. Therefore, doing this gives you the avenue to reach in and help open that individual up for heightened self-awareness. Six, make real human connections with sincerity and authenticity. Now, uh, we are all victims at some point of this um, um, perhaps PC world in, in, in the workplace and our professional setting. Um, and sometimes that obscures us from being fully or completely authentic in our conversations or interactions with individuals. So I would urge making real, spending real time and effort uh, to be, be sincere and authentic. Number seven, learn improv. I'm not sure if this comes as a surprise to some, but improv has been extremely helpful to my practice as an agile coach. So I highly recommend Paul Godard's book and course on improving agile teams, um, where he teaches safety, spontaneity, um, storytelling, status, and sensitivity. It will help you feel for the people that you interact with a lot better. Eight, mix things up with various facilitation, facilitation techniques, such as liberating structures or even Slack banter. Be creative. So now, um, while we know we can't really train ourselves to be creative, we, I'm sure most of us have someone that we know who is really creative and that we can reach out for inspiration, right? And simple things that we can do, uh, and it's already on the mirror board that we see, right? Make it fun. Buy lunch or drinks for your team. Number nine, um, and this is a really important one. Uh, so integrate invitation in what we do. And sometimes this requires increased awareness on our part. Um, so to quote Richard Becker, which is the founding father of organizational development, right? This is one, this statement here is one of the most important assumptions of successful OD. And that is that people support what they help create. And people affected by a change must be allowed active participation and a sense of ownership in the planning and conduct of the change, right? This happens even in or especially in our retrospectives. Um, what we are trying to do there is really to take them on a journey of heightened or in, um, growth in self-awareness and self-actualization. So involve them in that process. A good example um, was maybe around a year ago, uh, we had a big project come in. And I was asked to advise on how to structure our scrum teams to deliver on a project. And um, I thought about it and I came up with a few scaling frameworks that I think might help us manage the work well or workflow well. So I, I proposed in the end um, that 
we sh we could try Scrum at um, pardon large scale Scrum um, LESS. Now it wasn't until a few months later in my agile coaching circles that it dawned on me that my proposal or recommendation came across as a soft imposition based on my specialist skill set as an agile coach. And that wasn't my intent. And I didn't have the requisite awareness at that point in time to understand that what I was doing was not invitational. So in hindsight, uh, self-retrospective, I would have preferred to table a few options to, to the team and invite them perhaps through an open space technology session or uh, through some other large, larger format meeting to decide for themselves how to self-form their teams and how to do this. Right, so uh, cognizance of invitation, uh, this is really important. And 10, um, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So this one is uh, to the Agile Manifesto. Uh, focus on individuals and your interactions in your work. So thank you, that's all I have. Okay, in the interest of time, uh, we could take uh, one or two questions, not more. Uh, so is there anything, could you please share the tips again? One, two, three, and four uh, is what is the question. So let's take this one because I think uh, it probably covers four uh, four areas or four topics that were presented, uh, Victor, so if we can quickly yep. go back to this and then we'll pause with this in the interest of time because then the yep. next session is late to start. Yes, absolutely. So um, tips, right? Yeah. So tip one, focus on becoming a good self-coach first before learning to coach others. Take snapshots. Yeah. Tip two, learn professional coaching. Tip three, coach the person, not the issue. And tip four, master and master courage. I hope this was helpful. Yes. So I think we are slightly over, but uh, nevertheless, Victor, it was a very good session. And I'm sure if the participants want to interact with you, they have your contacts so they can uh, definitely reach out. Uh, thanks a lot for making the time and sparing the time out of uh, Saturday afternoon to be with us and share a lot of insights into the conference. I hope you had a good time as much as we had hosting you. So on behalf of Regional Scrum Gathering Kolkata organization team, I would like to thank Victor for being here and for sharing so many insights with us. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank sure. you. Welcome. Okay, with this, I'm going to end this particular session. See you on the other side in the other sessions.